Okay, hi, I'm Katie Kane. I'm uh, very happy to be here. Um, uh, I'm happy to be um, in the presence of uh, my colleague, Bernadette Sweeney. Um, and I'm hoping that this will um, start up because I did spend a lot of time coming up with slides for y'all. Um, so, um, yeah, um, I'll get started right away, other than to say that I um, am a professor in the English department. I've lived here in Missoula since 1999. I'm from North Dakota originally. Um, I did my PhD work at the University of Texas at Austin, where I studied comparative colonialisms. And specifically, I um, studied the relationship under colonialism and under its land management strategies of Indian country and Ireland. The first uh, reservation uh, came into existence almost simultaneously, both in Ireland for the indigenous uh, uh, Irish-speaking people and then for um, uh, uh, Indians in the New World. So um, there's a really deep uh, uh, structural relationship that can be located uh, between the two um, communities. Uh, Bernadette and I uh, spoke last time at length about um, lament and the performance of lament in um, uh, James Joyce's short story, The Dead, and in um, uh, Riders to the Sea by uh, J.M. Singh. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit away from that um, um, tonight, but I'll be harking back to the uh, talk. Um, I want to start in five ways, which is not unusual for me. I want to start by invoking the poetry of Seamus Heaney, by citing James Joyce, by making reference to an article by Siobhan Donnelly in Palliative Medicine. Uh, the title of this article is Folklore Associated with Dying in the West of Ireland. And then I want to play a clip from an invaluable resource. Um, and I, I uh, 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 um, recommend this highly to you. It's called Talking with the Dead. It's on YouTube. Um, I was very happy to discover that. And it's a documentary, an Irish documentary, by the ever-brilliant uh, Pat Collins. So it has a, a little bit of a title that comes before it, True Lives, uh, Talking with the Dead. And as a, it was posted a couple years ago, and as of right now, it has two views, one of them being mine. So um, definitely take a look at that. Um, um, uh, and the documentary is, and this is from uh, 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 RTE's uh, website, uh, is about, quote, the hold that the dead have on the living in Ireland and on the tradition of the funeral in Irish culture. So here's the way I'm starting with Heaney. Heaney, speaking both of Hamlet and of Ireland, says in a poem, or a set of poems, Viking Dublin trial pieces, that... Hamlet and Ireland had a habit of, quote, coming to consciousness by jumping into graves. Joyce, echoing the familiarity of the Irish with death and speaking of Ulysses, said that absence is the highest form of presence. Practically speaking, these epistemic and lyric understandings of our essential proximity with death and the dying uh, are those tools in tradition, the care of the dying and the dead that attends, for example, to the mouth, Bissach and Voss, uh, so that, you know, care for the mouth is very important, um, both for the dying people and um, then for uh, uh, the dead. Um, so uh, that kind of care. Uh, the interdiction, for example, against weeping for two hours after the death to allow the being or the spirit to clear the body the opening of windows for its flight later on, the wake, etc. These tools and traditions should, as Donnelly argues, have much, this is a quote, quote, have much to teach us in the modern era. As a palliative caregiver of Irish traditions, she says, as professionals caring for the dying, we have much to learn from our ancestors' skills and attitudes. By our very expertise and professionalism, we may be disempowering the dead person and their natural carers, who as unpracticed amateurs, we often sideline, forgetting that the foundation of this amateurism is love. Reflecting on the relevant Irish past may challenge the modern direction of palliative care. And so what I'd like to do now is not start with this, but go back to the YouTube uh, video here that I had queued up. Um, so this is uh, Talking to the Dead. 
And I'm going to, I hope I've got it queued up to the right spot. We'll see here. And I don't run. Um, the community would turn in their attention towards the bereaved family. Oh, why would they do that? It was in their interests. I want to go back to 540 here. That we had the copy. See you there. about the Irish that we had the copyright on good grief, that what we did was that we took a scaffolding of ritual and we erected it around a family who had been battered, if you like, by the, the death that occurred. And what would happen is the local community would turn in their attention towards the bereaved family. Now, why would they do that? It was in their interests, because the health, the mental health of every community depended on the health of each individual cell or family within it. If they were farmers, so they'd let the hay lodge in the field. If they were fishermen, they'd beach the boats. And they took over the business of, of bereavement. I mean, they fed and watered everybody who came into the house. And the reason they did that was so the family wouldn't be distracted from the work of grieving by being busy, literally. Now, the family were in their own home. They kept the dead body in the house for a number of days to get used to that kind of reality. They shouldered him out themselves. They dug the grave themselves. They filled in the grave. They came back then. They had food and drink and talk and tears and laughter, whatever they wanted to be. In other words, they could be real. And you see, that was the whole purpose of it, was to allow them to be real and face the reality, feel the pain, and gradually recommit themselves back into the life of the community. Um, that was, uh, I didn't say, but that was uh, Christy Kennelly, um, who is a, um, uh, a, a writer and a student of grief, um, a, a scholar of bereavement in Ireland. Um, uh, he is returned to several times in this um, hour-long documentary. And there is something on Keening that if we have time I might come back to, but um, uh, again, I recommend you, uh, uh, I recommend this film to you. Um, I said that I wanted to start in five ways, but I find that I want a sixth in the form of a brief eulogy. I, perhaps inappropriately, dedicate this talk to Gerard Barton Costello, who was waked out of this world and into the other by the strains of Ulian pipes snaking their way around ACDC's catalog, and I further dedicate to his daughter, Erin Costello Wecker, my colleague who knew and kept the old ways. Okay, so at the last talk Bernadette and I gave, I advanced the claim that were James Joyce's short story, The Dead, to be read through the lens of Irish funerary traditions, then Gabriel Conroy's encounter with death in his own life, his soul, quote, swooning slowly as he hears the snow falling faintly through the universe and faintly falling like the descent of their last end upon all the living and the dead, that this encounter could be read as containing potential for rebirth rather than terminating in the modernist reading of paralysis and sta stasis. Uh, the reading that goes snow as general all over Ireland and then exile and cunning are our only weapons of escape. Um, we also talked ab about the Ban Huinta and the Lament for the Dead, Clina Marv, as part of the Irish tradition. And I, I have to um, say that that needs to be understood as locally realized. So it's not a general, like snow, all over Ireland. It's very much a locally specific thing, although there are some generalities. Um, so this tradition in which the dead were accompanied out of this world and into the next by singing and wailing from both the other world, the Banshee, and this world, the Ban Huinta. In other words, the practice of lament came from both the other world, what a Western Christian tradition would call an afterlife or a heaven, and this world. So we talked about that, and then we talked briefly about the intimacy, the imbrication, the nearness of the dead and the bodies of the living, the way those two bodies are together in traditional Irish conceptions of life and death. Um, and I said this last time, for the Irish, I'm kind of riffing on Faulkner here, hope he doesn't mind. For the Irish, the dead are never quite gone. In fact, they're not really ever dead. They remain adjacent to us. And I quoted this last time, too. Talk Thompson says in his article, The Irish She Tradition, that the Irish other world is a very active world of the dead, which coexists on Earth with the realm of the living. The other word, world was variously called the land of the living, 
delightful plain and the land of the young. So that's my summary of where we were last time. Now it's to the traditions or conceptions, I should say, of death in Irish oral traditions that I want to, to return to today, to speak briefly about the ways in which the dead, death, and the other world were conceived of in traditional Irish notions from the Druidic era to the present, and specifically in popular consciousness. So we looked at, you know, literature last time. I'm interested in sort of how these things get taken up across the Atlantic, around the globe, in popular consciousness. And one way that we can signal the difference um, in Irish uh, relationships to death, and especially taking into account this notion of an essential proximity, and this is something I just recently learned in doing my uh, research for this uh, presentation, is that there's a strong difference between the relationship that Irish, the Irish and Irish Americans have to the graveyard um, when compared with um, other traditions. So um, in many Western and non-Western cultures, the graveyard is a fine and private place, and hence the sacred picnic among the graves, right, of Dia de los Muertos or my Scottish-English congregationalist great-aunt who daily ran her dogs through Linwood Cemetery in Dubuque, Iowa. You would not have had my father's side of the family doing that because the other world is close to them always and particularly in the natural world. The Irish and some Irish Americans have a sometimes avowed, so sometimes acknowledged, an often unconscious desire to avoid the graveyard, since those beings not waked out of this world properly and those beings from the other world might be present there. Again, this world and the other world are very proximate to each other. So um, in moving away from the graveyard and the lament and the wake and into the imaginative or lived experiences of death in Irish culture across centuries and oceans, um, I spoke last time about the sort of topography of uh, the other world um, in the she mounds in Ireland that are the visible, tangible topography of the other world. And now I want to spend a little bit more time with that, linger there, map out this top topography and identify some of its denizens. So the other world is right down the way in Ireland in the form of the she mounds called Avon Oblock by the ancient Irish. The other world was a mirror world and the living could travel there uh, only very rarely uh, and by finding the right portals, rats, as we see here, um, Rath Krogan Mound, um, and I've got the entrance, an, an entrance down here. Um, I meant to put a few more um, uh, images there, but just ran out of time to do that. So, um, but these Raths are seen to be a place where the veil is thin, where there's um, a connection between the worlds. Um, so uh, also, um, on my first slide here, um, there's an old story that you could follow a stag, which is associated with Kernuas, a figure in turn associated both with comfort given to the dead and the dying and with the other world. The stag, if you ever see him out in the woods, is easily recognized, but recognizable by its huge size, by its unearthly glow, and its red eyes. So if you see that kind of stag and you're uh, wanting to go to the other world, uh, have at you. Water was also a particularly open conduit, uh, Ireland being a very watery place, that makes sense, um, either west over the sea uh, to Tech Duin, or in waterfalls or rivers where the she might pass and so might the dead. In the medieval poem, Balia Suthin Sith Auna, it is said that the god Lug was, Lu, excuse me, was reared in Avon Ablok. This is the god associated with Lunasa, the Harvest Festival, about which the great dramatist uh, Brian Friel has written. Um, in another poem from the uh, 14th century, Avon Ablock is described as being filled with swans and ewes. And all this starts to feel a little bit um, Edenic, um, especially because um, etymologically, uh, the word means um, rapidly moving stream of the apples. And sounds like, oh great, I'm down with Irish death. Get me to the place where the stream is moving and can have me some apples, I'll be really happy, right? Um, but uh, death in Ireland's tales and traditions, as we know, has uh, 
uh, since we connected with the Banshee last week, that death in Ireland shivers as well as comforts. And it's no surprise then that a host of formidable and enduring figures of death surround the traditions of Ireland. And when they have these uh, uh, figures, uh, uh, enduring figures of death, when they have that effect, the Donnelly and uh, Kennelly note of providing for good grief, I will note that. Because there's a way in which things like the Banshee and the Doolahan and these things I'm going to be briefly talking about contain lessons about good grief and good death and good dying. They're really incredibly interesting. Um, and I, I suppose for scholars of uh, oral history, um, there's no surprise there that they're not just, uh, you know, wee fairies or stories, but uh, they contain um, uh, knowledge, uh, community knowledge. Okay, so um, in general, the darker versions of death in Ireland are meant to point to the loss and longing entailed in death for those still in this world, and to the darkness that one finds if grief is not allowed to flower and the dead to be accompanied across to the other world. They are cautionary tales, not in the sense of warning, but in the sense of learning. So my first slide, uh, moving is the Doolahan. And some of you may know the Doolahan. Uh, you may know him in the figure of the Headless Horseman, an icon of death who rides the road. Uh, he came out of the Celtic world in Europe, lodged in Ireland, crossed the Atlantic, and has found his way into Japanese video games. Um, he's made an appearance in ghost stories around the world. He's also known as the Headless Horseman. The Irish ver version is a lot scarier than the one we're familiar with, um, really and truly. Um, the Doolahan, Dark Man, was a harbinger of death whose origins are in deep, deep Irish history. He's thought to be the narrative incarnation of Crom Duve, a fertility god who demanded blood sacrifice in the form of decapitation. And I haven't really dug too deeply into the whole, like, focus on heads in Ireland. I'm going to play you a little something at the end of um, this talk that comes back to heads, but uh, I, I, I need to do more work there. Um, so it, it comes from Crom Duve, who was a fertility god and then wanting all these heads. Uh, the worship ended with Christianity, so too did his sacrifices, and um, in some ways he morphed into this, right? Um, one of the most interesting things, the things my kids love, is that his whip is a human spine. So um, he's unstoppable, pretty much. Um, he comes uh, traveling down the road, calls your name, and there's some sense that maybe some gold might halt him, but really there is not much that you can do to halt him. Um, so uh, the Doolahan is recorded in uh, fairy and folk tales of the Irish pe peasantry, which was edited by Yeats. Um, and uh, in this book it says, an omen that sometimes accompanies the banshee is the Koshta Bauer, or the Kocha Bauer in, in English, an immense black coach mounted by a coffin and drawn by headless horses driven by a doulahan. It will go rumbling to your door, and if you open it, a basin of blood will be thrown into your face. <sighs> yeah, it's, it's quite something. And I think there's a way in which the violence of death and the speed of death are present in both this figure and then in the, uh, uh, the coach that we're going to see an image of in a minute. And I've just taken these from various artists online. There's quite a fascination with these um, stories, but I think that they're deeply connected in Ireland to understandings of death. The death can come suddenly. The death comes for you um, in, in a very individually specific kind of way. So here's the Koshta Bauer, uh, the coach of death. Um, uh, uh, it often um, attends the Doolahan as he stalks the night, or he can drive it. Um, and here's what Thomas Johnston Westrop says in a folklore survey, survey of County Clare. On the night of December 11th, this is just a historical, um, a nod to the historical record. A servant, of, a servant of the McNamara's was going his rounds at Enstimon. This is about seeing uh, the Koshta Bauer. In the dark, he heard the rumbling of wheels on the back avenue, and knowing from the hour and place that no mortal vehicle could be, could be coming, concluded that it was the death coach and ran on, opening the gates before it. He had just time to open the third gate and throw himself on his face beside it at the bank before he heard a coach go clanking past. It did not stop at the house, but passed on. The following day, uh, somebody died. Uh, I'm sure that some of you recognize 
the Kashta Bauer. Um, it's appeared in popular culture, and I see there are people of my age here. So, of course, you you will remember Darby O'Gill and the Little People, right? And the coach in Darby O'Gill and the Little People. But it's also the case, and I find this incredibly interesting as somebody who's occasionally taught the Coen brothers, that the Ballad of Buster Scruggs, the very last segment of that film, has a death coach in it. And because they're Americans, they have no clue what's going on, and they can a squabble and argue with each other and do not prepare themselves for death, right, as they're hastening toward it. So I find the Kashta Bauer um, uh, really interesting because the focus here is on the compression of uh, the temporal or of time at death right? Sudden death, as was the case for my father, is unexpected and unanticipated. Thinking about the Kashta Bauer helps to prepare you to think about how these deaths might crop up in your life, right? Like it might happen the way a coach comes down the road for us. You know, it would be a car, but um, the way that it travels swiftly, right, and anonymously. Um, so here's one more example of, um, like, right now, legit my favorite Irish like death creature. I, I'm just like really, really entranced by this. This is um, a, a, a Norse version of the, um, uh, uh, the Slua is how it's pronounced by Peter Nikolai Arbo. And it's uh, uh, the Wild Hunt. And this is painted in 1872. But it's a really good rendering of the Slua. You can see the ground down here. Um, you know, they're high above, right? So um, Slua and Amarv, host of the dead, were the hosts of the dead who linger in this world and also representatives of a fear that grief can give way to melancholy. So there's sort of two things that the Slua do, and that is, okay, just to sort of slow down here, and I hope I don't repeat myself because I've gotten it all written down, but these are... Um, once living human beings who are still hanging around. Maybe they weren't waked properly. Maybe you started to cry right away and the spirit never left the, uh, the you know, place of its death. But they somehow, and, and this really predates limbo. Like the first time I saw this, I went, oh, well, that's kind of like limbo. You know, souls are just hanging around, unrepentant maybe, or, you know, um, good souls who didn't get back, you know, whatever. I went right there. But in fact, this absolutely predates limbo. I wonder if there's some kind of um, relationship. But um, uh, so there are two things the SLUA will do. Um, and actually, let me define them just a little bit more. In the words of folklorist Lewis Spence, the slua, or she host, was regarded as composed of the beings of the dead flying through the air. Uh, they usually approach from above. They fly in patterns similar to birds, so be careful if you see a big host of birds heading your way. Uh, watch them as they get closer. They might morph into the slua. But actually, you have some ability to fight that off, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. They fly in patterns similar to birds, but are able to approach and pick up and transport a living human, usually, obviously, to their physical detriment or death. However, the slua primarily steal the spirits of the living and sometimes the dying if they're not being properly cared for or just prior to their being um, uh, properly cared for. In Ireland, the slua are said to come in from the West, so it's one of the reasons, among many, there are other reasons, it's a really overdetermined thing, that um, uh, there's this tradition in Ireland of keeping the doors and the windows that are facing west closed as somebody is dying um, or immediately after um, their death, right? Um, so what I find interesting is there's a warning to take care of the dead properly, to, you know, care for their body, to handle their body um, with respect and with love. But it's also the case that you can call the slua to you. And one of them is a kind of like candy man kind of way. You can call just by saying the slua, han slua, you know. Um, but also, you can call them to yourself if you... Um, allow your mourning to become debilitating melancholia. So if you lose somebody and you do not return to life in that way that Kennelly was talking about, the slua will look for you, right? It's said, for those who cannot cease longing for the dear departed, the slua may come to finish the work that was started by the loss of the loved ones. It is the slua who come and not a broken heart. Um, so, uh, 
I have other, um, you know, Irish death creatures, as I'm kind of calling them, um, that I want to talk about. Like, I want to talk about our talk, the vampire, um, especially since one of my ancestors apparently killed the thing. So, but I don't, I don't think I'll go there. Um, I do want to talk uh, just briefly, because I'll set you up for this last slide, about um, the Derek Dew, who's really interesting. Um, vampires uh, kind of got their start in Ireland. Um, uh, Derek Dew means red death or uh, red blood. Um, it's about a female vampire who drains you of, of all of your um, uh, blood. And Bram Stoker knew about these traditions, or at least scholars believe very strongly that he did. So, um, you know, while uh, Dracula may have some influences coming from Slavic countries, et cetera, it's also very much a homegrown kind of thing. But I just wanted to end um, with this. Here's another popular... Um, incarnation of uh, these uh, you know, creatures uh, who are close to death in Ireland. This is Derek Doom. They masculinized um, the, the female uh, vampire in ways that I think are really um, interesting and then turned it into a rock band. I'm not going to do the whole thing, which is too bad because Johnny Fiend's guitar solo is really great, but um, I'll, uh, I hope we can see this. Oh. And you can hear Jim starting, uh, Jim Lockhart starting there on the Ulian uh, pipes. But um, that was the heads that I wanted to talk to you about. When the stars go out, you can hear me shout, two heads are better than none. 100 heads are so much better than one. So I definitely commend the horse lips to you as well. They came to uh, the University of Montana some like 10 years ago or so now. But that's all I have for you this afternoon. And I'll turn it over to the fabulous, marvelous Bernadette Sweeney. All right, can everybody hear me? Great. Uh, thank you so much, Katie, for, if nothing else, reminding me of my older brothers with horse lips. <laughs> um, uh, Katie and I spoke last week, as uh, some of you may know, and we spoke to, uh, Katie spoke to The Dead by Joyce, and I spoke to Riders to the Sea uh, by uh, John Middleton Singh. Uh, my name is Bernadette Sweeney, and I'm a professor in the School of Theatre and Dance. Um, I'm from Ireland. I moved here in 2008. And uh, my role here is really to talk about different representations of death and grief in um, Irish theatre, which is one of my specialisations. Um, I did a PhD in theatre in Trinity College in Dublin and uh, was really lucky to be able to continue my work as an, as an actor and director um, while also digging a little bit deeper into some of the uh, into the research, and a big part of my research was to place performance at what I felt, pull it in from the wings or the sidelines, um, and make it part of uh, uh, 
what was really becoming very well recognised as an Irish tradition of, uh, of performance literature and of theatre. And of course, at the time, there was an awful lot of commodification of Irish writers in the um, uh, uh, 1990s and the early 2000s. Um, there were all these posters that you could buy that were, you know, real uh, fodder for the tourists of Irish writers. And they were nearly all playwrights. It was Oscar Wilde and J.M. Singh and W.B. Yeats. Um, very rarely was there a woman on there, of course, but Gregory made her way on there late, later. Um, but I was really kind of annoyed by that, quite frankly, as an actor, and uh, really wanted to try to place the work of the actor and the work of the performer um, a little bit more within what was becoming recognised as a really rich tradition. And of course, I have see great value in looking at the scripts and in, in um, performance research, um, script analysis and so forth, and have been really lucky to be able to work with Katie um, and some of uh, my other colleagues in the English department and in the Irish Studies program. Um, but I'm a theatre maker, and uh, I really feel that it's important when we're looking at the Irish theatre tradition that we acknowledge and recognise the, uh, the role of performance and the role of um, time spent together in the theatre. So I'm going to shift our talk a little bit in the direction of uh, a consideration of Irish theatre. Um, and uh, uh, then Katie and I will take questions um, uh, at the end. So uh, again, we're here uh, at Ashby's invitation and, and uh, at the invitation of the NEH um, as part of a much bigger project, which um, uh, was really, uh, I was originally approached by Ashby about this project a number of years ago um, to try to look at how we consider death in the community um, and to bring all of these different areas of specialization together. And as I said, my area of specialization is in, is in Irish theatre and in performance, ritual and tradition. And how, how might some of these traditions help us to reimagine death and conversations about death, dying and grief? Um, part of what we've been doing, myself and Katie, today and last week, has been looking at, we've been looking at aspects of lament and we're looking at manifestations and performances of grief in, um, in Irish culture. Irish traditions around death, um, grief and loss that have been staged in Irish theatre include Cuina or Keening, um, which we discussed a little bit last week. Um, ritual music. <laughs> I wasn't thinking of horse lips when I wrote that, but now I am. Um, waking the dead and staged absence. And that's something that, uh, as a, again, as a theatre maker, as a, a, a previously an actor and now a director, I'm really fascinated by how we stage subtext often on stage. Um, by, uh, by referencing what's absent, um, whether that's through time or referencing a character that's not on stage um, uh, or uh, 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 making reference to a presence, that, like a presence that's absent, whether it's a spiritual presence or a physical presence. And Beckett, of course, is renowned for this, and I'll, I'll get to him in a moment. Um, as I said last week, I talked a little bit about Riders to the Sea and the performance of Quina or Keening um, staged in the text. Riders to the Sea is set on the Aran Islands off the Clare and Galway coast. I'm from County Clare myself. Um, and uh, I'm really, I, I, I've always been really interested in the rhythms of the ocean and how um, there's so, so much a huge part of, um, of the musicality of Irish theatre and Irish theatre making. Um, with Riders to the Sea, we see how in that play um, they're, they're, the characters are really struggling to eke out an existence. Um, uh, uh, they're, they're subject to the sea, of course, and its vagaries, but they also get their livelihood from the sea. So they have a really difficult and, and uh, tenuous um, relationship there. So there's almost like a staged conflict, if you like, um, uh, before the play even starts. One of the things I referenced last week was um, how uh, keening is this performative tradition in Irish uh, culture. And oftentimes, uh, there, 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 historically, there was a certain amount of, um, uh, there was a dismissive attitude to aspects of uh, traditional Irish culture in high academia. Um, and I, I really felt it was important as part of my research 
um, which um, was performing the body in Irish theatre to look at some of these different performance traditions and see how they made their way onto the stage, how in some instances um, plays uh, actually uh, document that tradition and safeguarded that tradition um, uh, by then disseminating the tradition to the audience. So what do I mean by that? So Singh, for example, he, he went and lived on the Aran Islands um, uh, in the early 1900s. He documented this livelihood of the Aran Islanders who lived off the Irish coast. Um, and then he included the tradition of, of keening in his play, Riders to the Sea. So then the play has a very urban life in Dublin. Um, and beyond that, as uh, it's now rec internationally recognized as a beautifully formed one-act play. Um, and it includes this tradition of keening. So he's, he has, to a certain extent, disseminated that tradition quite widely. Um, uh, Different productions, of course, include the challenge of keening in different ways. And it's a tradition that had not necessarily practiced, um, but it would have been practiced right up until the early, um, uh, the late 19th century, for example, and perhaps even into the early 20th century. It lives on in different ways, though, um, uh, in the musicality of grief and in the, um, the way in which, in, it's still in contemporary Irish culture, certainly with any of the funerals in my family, um, the, the, the waking and the time for grieving is very much part of the, of the funerary process. Um, in another play of Sings, uh, in the shadow of the, sometimes uh, documented as the shadow of the Glen and sometimes described as in the shadow of the Glen, um, he uses a very, uh, he, takes, he makes a very melodramatic almost take on the notion of a wake and uh, Docu the play documents the tradition of waking the dead. Uh, the main character fakes his death and his wake to catch his wife um, and in her infidelity. Um, the play opens with Nora, the wife, um, worrying about the, the death of, of, of her husband and asking a stranger, a, a tramp who's passing for help. Again, giving us a sense of the isolation um, of, their, of their home and how isolated she would have been as a young wife. Nora describes her husband as follows. He was an old man and an odd man, a stranger. And it's always up on the hills he was thinking thoughts in the dark mist. She pulls back a bit of the sheet. Lay your hand on him now and tell me if it's cold he is surely. The tramp replies, is it getting the curse on me you'll be woman of the house? I wouldn't lay my hand on him for the luck Nahanigan, and it filled with gold. Nora looks uneasily at the body. Maybe cold would be no sign of death with the like of him, for he was always cold, every day since I knew him, and every night, a stranger. She covers up his face and she comes away from the bed. And that's just a little moment of, uh, again, Singh is setting us upright. Um, uh, we know that there's something amiss with this wake and with this body. Um, but I love the, the, the playfulness that Singh um, illustrates there in referencing the coldness of the body and bringing um, uh, it to the foreground as a reference to the coldness of the marriage. Um, we all recognize in the audience, we recognize the tradition of waking the dead, of having the dead uh, body in the home, uh, being covered, being present um, in, the, in, in the house, so as Katie referenced earlier in referencing that um, documentary, uh, to allow those close to the family to get used to the, to the notion of the, of the loved one being dead, or in this instance, the not loved one who actually was not dead. <clears throat> we also see in this early period of the, um, uh, the establishment of the Irish National Theatre, uh, the Abbey Theatre in the early 1900s, the establishment of the Irish National Theatre was a form of resistance. It was an act of resistance because the Irish nation wasn't uh, yet um, free from British colonialism. The Abbey Theatre founded in 1904, Ireland's National Theatre. Um, death is staged in really interesting ways um, in the work of these early um, uh, uh, Irish playwrights, people like Yeats and Augusta Gregory, the two of the founders of the Abbey Theatre, J.M. Singh. Um, Yeats and Gregory uh, worked together to uh, craft a play called Kathleen Houlihan. And Kathleen Houlihan 
um, is really a call to arms. It's propaganda. It's quite uh, recognisably uh, uh, propaganda now. Um, it's a, again a little play, a one-act play. The Abbey really um, specialised in these one-act plays at that time. And in these early pl political plays, we see death um, uh, having a very high resonance in terms of its power to move the audience. Uh, and um, Yeats himself worried afterwards that that little play of his sent out men um, that the English shot after the, um, after the Rising. Uh, in the play uh, Kathleen e. Hulhan, we see Ireland as, a, as an old woman and she comes to the cottage in Killala in County Mayo um, looking for help, looking for um, uh, young men to come to fight for her and her freedom and her four green fields, which are the, uh, the four provinces of Ireland. Um, we see uh, uh, the old woman in this play references Keening as well. We talked about Keening last week. Um, she sings, do not make a great keening when the graves, graves have been dug tomorrow. Do not call the white scarfed riders to the burying that shall be tomorrow. Do not spread food to call strangers to the wakes that shall be tomorrow. Do not give many money for prayers for the dead that shall die tomorrow. They shall have no need of prayers. They will have no need of prayers. So she sings this song to Michael, the young man, to... Um, to really give that sense of the heroism that she's demanding of these young men to fight for her and that these regular rituals of death won't apply because their death will be otherly um, and heroic. He of course follows her much to the grief um, of his family and we all know of course from history how, um, uh, uh, how history plays out. Um, at the very end of the play the father uh, asks the younger brother, the 12 year old, who's standing in the doorway, did you see an old woman going down the path? And he says, I did not, but I saw a young girl and she had the walk of a queen. So we see again in this play, the transformative um, uh, power of death and sacrifice for the Irish nation. So here we have um, uh, rituals of death being used to stage an, a version of native Irishness. We have rituals of death and their questioning being staged to um, uh, uh, be a call to arms and propaganda for, um, for the Irish to fight in service of Irish freedom. Um, uh, I reference, there's another play title there called In the Shadow of a Gunman, and that was a play by O'Casey who came a little bit later. Um, uh, he also wrote in that play, um, very much set in urban Dublin, um, to the power of the political sacrifice. And, and he's, he's really fascinating uh, playwright because he, he questions um, that in really interesting ways and was really, really interested in socialism as well. But we also see representations of death, grief and dying through absence in the theatre of later 20th century Irish playwrights like Beckett and Brian Friel, who um, Katie mentioned, uh, Marina Carr, Conor McPherson and Enda Walsh. And I just want to talk about those um, and some of the choices that they make in their stagings of death um, uh, here for a little bit. So many, if not all of you, will have heard of Samuel Beckett, um, very, very uh, uh, well known in internationally, um, playwright from Dublin, and uh, Brian Friel, uh, uh, author, a uh, playwright of um, Dancing at Lunasa, that's probably his most famous title. Beckett was born in a well-off suburb of County Dublin, uh, South Dublin, uh, called Fox Rock, on Good Friday, April the 13th, which he was very proud of, in 1906. Uh, he studied in Trinity, he spent a lot of his artistic life in France, mostly in Paris, and he wrote in French and in English. His works were considered masterpieces of 20th century modernism and postmodernism. His, his career kind of um, straddles both of those um, isms, as it were. Uh, his novels include Murphy, Watt, Malloy, Malone Dies, and The Unnameable. He is especially well known for his play Waiting for Godot, first published in, uh, first produced, sorry, in 53, Endgame, 57, Crap's Last Tape, 58, and Happy Days, 61. His work is very minimalist, sometimes described as absurdist. His characters are often 
to be found in very bleak landscapes and situations. As a playwright who then became a director, he makes incredibly powerful use of silence, light, presence and absence, gesture and object. And as he is credited now by some sources as being um, the most widely produced playwright after Shakespeare. So these are two images from two of his plays, Happy Days, um, first produced in 61, and Footfalls in um, 1976. I want to bring your attention to the Happy Days image first of all. This is um, Fiona Shaw playing the character of Winnie. Um, and many of you may know this play. It's pretty iconic in its imagery. Um, uh, she's, she's buried up to her waist for the first part of the play, and then she's buried up to her neck um, for the second part of the play. And her, her, her world is literally shrinking as she becomes more and more um, uh, uh, buried in this mound of dirt or sand. And it's, it's pretty easy to read this metaphor, obviously. Um, uh, here we see uh, Beckett is really questioning our notion of existence and, and why we are here and where we are going um, with this incredibly powerful image. Um, some uh, actors re um, ref ref refer to this role as the female equivalent of what Hamlet might be for a male identifying actor. Um, What we see here in, in, with this, in this world, uh, in Winnie's world, as it gets smaller and smaller, um, and her, 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 it's harder for her to reach her things, her things are, are becoming more dilapidated from um, act one to act two, and she's, we're, we're seeing less and less of her. Um, we, we, we have a really visceral connection to what this character is feeling, right? We know that the actor is uncomfortable. And that's part of what Beckett is staging for us. He uses our visceral response, our live shared presence with the actor to, to, to make his point about life and death in this incredibly powerful image. And it's one he comes back to again and again in different ways. The image next to it is Footfalls, um, first produced in uh, 1976. And Footfalls is a, a character, uh, a woman referred, variously, referred to variously as Amy or May. And she's having a conversation with her mother who is off stage. And she, she walks in this pathway of light. Oh, wow, right on cue. The lights disappear. I was just about to say that. And, and the lights disappear as she is making wow. her pathway uh, in this little band of light on the, on the stage floor. And it, as the play progresses, it becomes harder and harder for the audience to see her. And it becomes harder and harder for the audience to hear her. And so her, um, uh, and she, she, she becomes more and more um, kind of prone in her posture. Uh, and so again, with light and with darkness and with um, sound and the absence of sound, he's really bringing our attention to what it's like to be real and to have matter in the world um, uh, and using the liveness of the shared experience with the audience um, to, to ask questions of what does it mean to exist in this world um, and what are our responsibilities to ourselves and to each other. Again, the audience is uncomfortable. Um, this is the only, this, we only ever see her in this strip of light um, uh, and, and she has this incredibly prescribed little pathway that she never deviates from. And we have a visceral response and engagement with that. Two other plays um, that he, where he uses um, the image of uh, what we can see and what we can feel really centrally um, are Not I, first produced in 72, and Crap's Last Tape, first produced in um, 58. I had the great pleasure of um, directing another colleague of ours, Michael Murphy, from this um, media arts program at the university. He's a really fine actor. Um, I had the great pleasure of directing uh, him in a production of Crap's Last Tape a number of years ago. Uh, and that play, it's, uh, it's, it's only five pages, but it takes 55 minutes to perform it. Um, and part of that is so much of the action is in the stage directions. So much of what we see is we watch him doing rather than listening. Um, so let me see if this isn't, this is a different production. This is jo uh, John Hurt. Let me see if I can get that to work. I'm going to, I'm going to be 
ambitious and try and scroll forward and see if that works. So this is a character, Crap, um, uh, and he has recorded himself on his birthday throughout the years. And we meet him at age 69, and he's playing back different versions of himself. So again, Beckett is using time, duration, um, uh, and uh, a presence and absence to bring our attention to questions of our existence. And, in, in, and so what we see is we see, we see crap present, but we are also conscious of his absence because we're not with the 29-year-old him and we're not with the 39-year-old him, we're with the 69-year-old him. And of course, the title of the play is Crap's Last Tape. Um, so we can assume where this is going. before embarking on a new retrospect. Hard to believe I was ever that young whelp. Voice, Jesus. And the aspirations. <laughs> and the resolutions. <laughs> to drink less in particular. <laughs> Statistics. 1,700 hours out of the preceding 8,000 odd consumed on licensed premises alone. More than 20%, say 40% of his waking life. Plans for a less engrossing sexual life. <laughs> Last illness of his father, flagging pursuit of happiness, unattainable laxation, sneers at what he calls his youth, and thanks to God that it's over. False ring there. So in that little extract, we're watching Crap listening to himself um, from years ago. But he's describing having listened to an even earlier version of himself from 10 years previous to that. And so we have, we have the 69-year-old Crap on stage with us, but we have these other versions of him, these younger versions of him being referenced. I love the moment when, when the onstage actor laughs with the recorded version of himself. And of course, the actor in the foreground isn't crap either. It's an actor playing crap. And so you have almost like these, it's like a hall of mirrors. Um, but somewhere in all of this is that the essence of existence is being questioned by Beckett. And we are, of course, um, questioning that in the, in live in the, in the theater with the actor performing this. Also, we are very much aware too of um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the machinery. He's playing with this old um, tape recorder. Uh, 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 he references the word spool a lot. Um, so we're aware now that this is old technology. Um, and in, in this one, he, we see he has a very particular pathway. Again, Beckett loves these pathways around his desk. Um, and you can see in this production, which was filmed a, a gate theater and Irish National Television, RTE, co-production. Um, they, they really built up the stage to show us all of the stuff that he would have been um, collecting and living in um, over time. So we see time being staged by Beckett in really interesting ways. And of course, um, as we know, time runs out. Um, and we know that, of course, in the title as well, this being Crap's last tape. This one I'm not going to play. Um, uh, just in the interests of time, but this is Lisa Dewan um, uh, performing Not I. And that play, if you know, if you, if you know it, um, all you can see on stage is the mouth that you can see on the, on the slide um, on your left as you're looking at the screen. And so this is a short documentary um, uh, where uh, the actor is recorded getting ready to perform and all of the things she has to do um, to be able to perform where the, 
all the audience can see is her mouth moving and she speaks incredibly quickly as she's performing this piece. And so existence is, is absolutely stripped back to just the words and just the, the mouth again. And, but we know in the audience how uncomfortable the actor must be. And so her, her, her temporality, if you like, is constantly being under, underlined by this style of production. Brian Friel, um, uh, another very well-known Irish playwright. He was uh, born in Northern Ireland, um, uh, and he lived. He actually founded a theatre company in Derry, but lived just over the border in Donegal once the company was well established. Um, but he founded in Northern Ireland, uh, in County Derry, a company called Field Day Theatre Company, and he um, he founded that with uh, stage and screen actor Stephen Ray in 1980. And Translations was the first production of, of that company. Um, he's, as I say, well known for writing Dancing at Lunasa, um, which went on to have great international success and was made into a film version with Meryl Streep. Um, Translations is centered around the mapping of County Donegal by the British forces in 1833. It's a very, very obvious exercise in colonialism. Um, uh, the theatrical device that Friel uses is he uh, stages two languages through, the, through one. So uh, all the characters, all the actors speak in English, but the characters speak in Gaelic or in English. So the characters, we, he writes it brilliantly so that we know when they're speaking amongst themselves, they speak in um, Gaelic. And then when they're speaking to the soldiers and the powers that be, the colonial powers, they speak in English. Um, so uh, translations, as I said, set in County Donegal, where Friel um, uh, had five aunts uh, and his uh, family would have come from there. And he actually wrote uh, Dancing at Lunasa as a tribute to his five aunts, two of whom died um, uh, uh, homeless in, in London years, years after. The central image of translations, though, is one of absence. And this is, a call, I, I feel like, a, a, a reach back to the work of uh, Gregory and Yeats with that early work, Kathleen Houlihan. Um, absence and death as the, and the political power of that and what that might mean for a, 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 a nation emerging or trying to emerge from the yoke of colonialism. In the play, Translations, which is set in the schoolroom in a hedge school or an illegal Irish native school, um, uh, there are two students who are missing, the Donnelly twins, and they're constantly ref referred to in the script as being not there. Um, uh, I, I was able to stage this a few years ago for the School of Theatre and Dance here at the university. Um, and it's really interesting. You know that when you read the script, when there's two empty stools on stage, it's so much more powerful. Their, their, their presen presence and absence is constantly being um, referred to. Their, their presence in other instances, not when we're in the theatre, and their absence when we're in the theatre, these two stools that are constantly absent. And we know, of course, that the Donnelly twins are um, uh, uh, freedom fighters, and uh, their, their absence is very, very significant for the fate of the town at the hands of the British forces, because they're up to no good. Um, and sure enough, over the course of the play, we're introduced to a character called um, Yolland. And uh, it, Friel is really, really clever in that he sets up some of the English forces as very unlikable figures and characters in the play. But the character of Yolland is a really sympathetic character. And of course, he's the love interest for the, uh, one of the young local girls, Moyer. Um, and, uh, uh, then he is missing and assumed dead. Um, and so we, we, we have the experience in the theater of forming a connection with this character who's a very sympathetic character. And then the, the implications of his absence become all the more powerful. So Friel is using absence and the death of a character to make a very powerfully motivated, politically motivated point. And he's using some of the techniques that we see uh, Beckett using as well, um, but in a very different way. I'm conscious of time, so I'm, I'm not going to go through all of the rest of this, but there are a, a, a number of more recent playwrights um, uh, who are also referencing 
and staging death, a dying grief and loss in really interesting ways, in ways that we can uh, maybe perhaps um, uh, learn from uh, 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 in a broader, more cultural, culturally um, uh, informed way as well. Uh, very central to the theatre making of these three playwrights are uh, presence, superstition, absence, and theatricality. Um, Marina Carr was born in County Offaly in 1964. She's from the Midlands. She's very heavily influenced by Beckett. Um, and uh, she, in her plays, she references presence, absence, uh, a lot of classical uh, texts, Greek mythology, um, uh, Shakespeare. Uh, uh, she reimagines and reconfigures some of those older texts. Uh, the play that I'm particularly interested in in the context of this talk is a play called Woman and Scarecrow, which was first produced in 2006. Um, this is an incredibly powerful play. Um, and it is a, a, another kind of a version of a, of a lament. And in this instance, the woman laments herself. Um, we, we meet a, a, a woman uh, on her deathbed. And she uh, is uh, 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 confiding, raging um, against and with this character, this, this very nebulous character companion called Scarecrow. And she's really um, uh, uh, grieving for the life that she didn't have, for the, for the marriage that she didn't have, uh, uh, for the fidelity that she didn't get from her husband. Um, she had uh, uh, eight children. And Scarecrow references these, uh, her, her voracious motherhood in, uh, in, this, in this monologue here. Scarecrow says, numbers, you just wanted numbers. You just wanted to look and say, this one is mine, and this one, and this, and him, and her, and those, and that pair up there in the oak tree, mine, all mine. That's what you wanted. Greedy for numbers. Insatiable for the head count, the leg count. I own 16 pairs of legs, and the two that didn't make it, and eight noses, and 16 eyes, and the two that didn't make it, and 16 ears, and 80 fingers, and 80 toes, and reciting their names and ages to knock yourself out after another exhausting day of counting and coveting, and even still wondering if you could squeeze another one in as you slide to your grave. Motherhood, which is often such um, a, a, a powerful archetypal image central to um, the Irish theatre tradition and the Irish theatre canon, is really being messed with by Carr here. Um, uh, and Scarecrow's uh, condemnation of the, of the role of the mother as, as, again, voracious and greedy and just wanting to cheat death by creating more and more children. And in this moment, as, she, as Scarecrow says, wondering if you could squeeze another one in as you slide to your grave. It's an incredibly powerful play. Um, uh, it's not for the faint-hearted. But it is, uh, uh, again, we see uh, death and, and uh, questions of mortality and what do we leave behind us being questioned in really interesting ways by Carr. Connor McPherson, um, he's from Dublin. He was born in 1971. Uh, Some of his early plays are, are, he's very focused on storytelling and the Irish tradition of storytelling really informs his work as a playwright. Um, uh, uh, the play that really is of interest here um, is a play called The Weir, and it's built around a series of ghost stories. Um, uh, it's, uh, we see uh, uh, it's in a remote uh, little pub um, in the west of Ireland, and uh, a woman comes from Dublin, moves into the neighborhood or the area, and uh, she's clearly grieving. And over the course of this night in the pub, as each of the characters tells their story, she tells the story of how she lost her daughter and is haunted by her daughter, um, uh, uh, who was drowned as a child. And so um, uh, we see ghost stories and um, uh, uh, repetition being used really powerfully as uh, McPherson references the Irish tradition of storytelling. Uh, this is from a review of uh, the weir that appeared in the Irish Examiner, one of Ireland's national newspapers. The reviewer wrote, uh, is quoting uh, Macpherson. So Macpherson said, in Irish heritage, in folklore, and in stories of the fairies, I think there is something going on that's deeper than just stories and yarns, Macpherson says. I think it expresses something about the way that Irish people have viewed the world. 
that's been passed on to us, the way Irish people have understood nature, those religious beliefs, which would be called pagan beliefs now, personified the dark and the lighter sides of nature and of death and all of that. So in the story, uh, stories of the Banshees and all that kind of stuff, we're really hearing the echo of an old religion. I think that's probably why it's so deep in our bones. In um, McPherson's work, he's very uh, aware that he's referencing an, a really old Irish tradition of classic storytelling that reaches well b before or beyond Christianity. And lastly, I just want to mention Enda Walsh. Enda Walsh is uh, uh, also from Dublin. He's often associated very much with Cork because he came to professional prominence in, in Cork City. Um, he was the author of uh, Disco Pigs, the playwright of Disco Pigs, which was a huge hit in uh, the Edinburgh Festival and became in uh, internationally renowned. It also launched the career of actor Killian Murphy. He wrote the book For Once, the musical, some of you may be familiar with that, for which he won a Tony Award in uh, 2012. Uh, the play that I'm interested in, he in here is called Bally Turk, and it was first produced in 2016 at the Galway International Arts Festival, and again featured Killian Murphy. Um, in this play, we see two characters living uh, in a, a, a somewhere anonymous, and just living the rituals of, of every day. Their life has been reduced to really petty little rituals and arguments. Um, so it's almost absurdist in that way. Um, uh, our, the New York Times reviewer references how this play um, uh, was first uh, uh, references, or we can see very much the presence of people like Beckett and Pinter um, in the use of silence in the play. Um, uh, in the use of uh, uh, the, how their relationship is staged in the play. Um, the critic writes how Ballyturk traffics unapologetically in literature's biggest theme. I mean the point or pointlessness of life in the face of death and how we avoid or embrace our ultimate ends. And particularly how two people block the view of mortality with small talk and its physical equivalence. As two, the other character, Observed towards the play's conclusion, all he and one have been doing with their elaborate fantasies in their fantasy village has been filling a room with words. Um, which, in one way, is what Katie and I have been doing today. <laughs> but each of these playwrights is using, and again, referencing mortality and using the, the, the meta um, experience of going to the theater and watching life being performed before us as a way of uh, asking us to question um, our understanding of presence and absence of grief and of loss and ultimately of death. And in this theatricalization, this cathartic reinterpretation or imagining of what that might mean, um, I think that uh, theater and literature and art have an awful lot to offer us as we try to also wrestle with our own mortality. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of minutes if anybody has any questions. Uh, you talked at one point about graveyards and the differences between how people in some cultures look at graveyards. My experience uh, has been that uh, whenever we go to Ireland, that's always where my cousins want to go and visit is the graves. It's not a social thing, but it's a kind of a remembering thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think that, you know, care for, you know, the ancestors or the dead or relatives or whatever is different than the kind of um, way in which a graveyard is a kind of inert space in other traditions. Like, like my great aunt just, I mean, she used to put the back of her station wagon down where there were seven of us. You know, we'd fight for that, you know, uh, position and then run her dogs every day. I mean, there was no like sense of like the potential danger there or the the sacredness right and so um yeah i think i think in some ways that's a different kind of thing too and then there are all these stories in the tradition that bernadette so you know um 
adroitly um, uh, kind of limbed for us in drama, but also out in the popular consciousness that say, you know, do, you know, don't go by the graveyard at night and don't go doing this in the graveyard. No, 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 stay away from it, right? So, but yeah, I mean, but I will tell you too that when I when I've gone to Ireland, as you know, so many Irish Americans do, searching for connections, you know, to the past, I go to graveyards and I'm always shocked. There's like nobody there, like literally nobody. I'm the only person there for the two hours that I'm roaming around looking at headstones. So, um, yeah, um, interesting. And, you know, this is stuff I'm really discovering uh, through this whole uh, event. So I, I, I'd be interested in thinking about different ways to use the graveyard space, which is the last thing I'll say is, this is a problem when you ask a question of somebody who yeah, fills rooms with words. But um, there's a French thinker, Michel Foucault, who really wants to think about the way that graveyards reflect urban spaces, you know, or arranged spaces, right? And the way that they're laid out, you know, like blocks and, you know, on a north-south axis and this sort of, um, you know, uh, you know, home-like dwellings of certain, you know, uh, kinds of, you know, um, spaces that are present in graveyards. So it's a really interesting topic, I think. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Um, Bernadette. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you to go back to John Singh for a second. Uh -huh. And um, so he did a lot of traveling over in the Wicklow Mountains, in yep. that area. So I guess this is kind of a regional question. So would he find the same um, similarities between like Aran Islands and West Clare, the West Coast, as he would see in, say, the Wicklow, uh, in terms of like Keening and um, yes, prayer, I, prayer for the dead, I guess. I, I think so. Certainly um, a, a, a version of what you would see, and he very deliberately went to the Aran Islands and he went west um, uh, to Clare Galway, of course, and beyond to the Aran Islands, looking for a, a non-urban authentic Irish experience as native as possible. And of course, the, all those terms are hugely problematic, right? Um, you know, uh, I know Casey brilliantly staged that with his versions of, of Dublin in the Civil War or in, in the War of Independence. The bombings in Dublin were just as authentic an Irish experience as the, as the wakes on the Aran Islands. Um, but he was definitely reaching for some kind of performative ritual um, and, and Keening was one of the, those to be found, and Waking was another one. Uh, patterns, which maybe brings us back to the other question, was another one. A pattern was a, a set uh, journey through sacred spaces, um, and you would, uh, th there would be a holy well or some sacred space or a series of sacred spaces, and people would chart a pathway along uh, a, a route or route on Pattern Day. And it was a set route, and they would go on a loop and pray at different points. Um, and, and that reminds us that you know there are sacred spaces in the Irish landscape. And some of those have these Christian functions, if you like, as graveyards or as, or as patterns. Um, but they predate that. They're, they're definitely evident. There is definitely evidence of, of these being pagan rituals as well, some of which were appropriated by the church and some of which weren't. Um, in, in the outside of Dublin, you will have seen more of a prevalence of those kind of traditional performance rituals or traditional social rituals, religious or otherwise. Um, but you would still have seen some version of them, even in Dublin. Like I've been to a wake in Dublin that wasn't in a, um, wasn't in a funeral home, it was at somebody's house. So there is still, and there's always, you know, a really fluid relationship between the urban and the rural in Ireland because it's such a small place. And so many people have family um, that maybe went ahead of them. So like, you know, you go and you stay with your brother when you start college or whatever, but he's only been there for a few years before you. Um, so there are, there, there's a very close relationship between the rural and the urban as well. Any other questions? We have time for maybe one more. Yeah. Do they still do the wakes? I haven't seen one around here for a while. In, our, in Ireland? Here in the States. Um, when I first came here, I did a, a, a research project called The Gathering. Uh, it was funded by the Irish government and supported by the University of Montana, the Irish Studies Program. 
um, and the Office of Research and Sponsor Programs. Um, and for that, I, I set up a, an oral history project and uh, worked with quite a number of volunteers, some of whom are in the room, um, and interviewed quite a few uh, people. It was great for me because I was just from Ireland and I was homesick, so I got to speak to all these Irish Americans right. and feel better. Um, but uh, there was evidence of, in Butte especially, where my husband is from, uh, there was evidence of waking and um, references to keening. I didn't find any evidence of keening, but there was definitely an understanding of it. Um, uh, uh, there was Ren Boyce. I interviewed this absolutely fabulous person, uh, Tom Foley in, uh, in, in Butte, um, uh, talking about his experience with Ren Boyce um, and with wakes in houses. Uh, the extent to which that's still prevalent, I don't know. It's all gotten very sanitized in the last 20 years. Um, the extent to which death has been tidied away, uh, you know, that's that's a real phenomenon. It's not just an American phenomenon. We see that very much in Ireland now as well. But there are still um, some whole, some people holding on to at least the tradition of waking and of bringing the body back to the house. No, I, I would say in the gathering you could find that material. And uh, my father died in 69. We definitely had an Irish American, you know, wake for him both in North Dakota and then in Iowa. So the body was present during really, um, it, for, for me as a nine year old, incredibly enjoyable, you know, fun and running and screaming and, you know, playing and then people just sobbing and no, no keening, but very much, you know, in the tradition of being in front of the body and, you know, um, performing, as it were, for, for, you know, the body. Well, thank you so much. Thanks to Dr. Katie Kane and Dr. Bernadette Sweeney. And thanks so much for joining us.